Hey everybody, it's your friendly neighborhood game master Zach Call here, back in the library to continue getting first impressions, my first read through of the Level Up Advanced 5th Edition Core Rulebook from EN Publishing. If you haven't seen other videos about this game, check out the playlist that you'll see in the description. Go, I, I, I have looked at the intro, character creation, couple classes at this point, a couple martial, and we looked, I think most recently at the wizard. And I kind of want to jump past looking at all the classes. I, I've, um, not that I'm losing interest so much as I want to get to the rest of the game system as quickly as possible. I understand, I think, how classes are starting to look. There's more character options than vanilla fifth edition. They seem like, for the most part, the classes I've looked at, there's usually at least one or two um, combat abilities in your options that look look good and look like, yeah, we can totally use this completely fine. Or there's a good role-playing, like, hey, this works for my character's backstory option that is less optimized but not completely worthless, which is kind of what we're looking for. That's all good stuff. But we're going to skip past the class section. I, I might come back and look at maybe some of the brand new classes that aren't present in vanilla 5th edition. Um, but first, let's, let's find out more about the rest of the... Of this, uh, of the but first... But first, let's find out more about the rest of the system, starting with Chapter 4, Equipment. Here we are, and we've got chapter four pulled up of the rule book. If you are interested in getting the PDF for this, you can get uh, get it uh, at the Ian Publishing website or the Level Up 5e website. It will be in the doo doo for this video. So got equipment, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna go past this fairly quickly unless my eye catches something that is really different. Um, uh, the starting gold is interesting. Herald and Marshall, two classes I have not looked at yet, start out with way more access to funds than the rest. Um, Ranger then at 150, Fighter 140. I don't know if I love changing your starting gold based on your class, if I'm being completely honest. Um, it feels like... Okay, like it is, it is probably good that um, classes that are equipment dependent have enough gold to at least get access to that equipment as quickly as possible. But it also, like, I don't know, like, it kind of makes me feel bad. Like, hey, if I'm playing, let's say, a sorcerer, do I seriously need half the gold that a herald or marshal has? Why shouldn't I be able to get the same amount of gold? as them and use that extra gold on like a spell scroll or something like that. So something to keep an eye out for, at least on, on my end and, and maybe you, it, that might be something that I immediately homebrew or change. Um, okay. Trading currency, average day's wage for a skilled artisan is a single gold piece. A gold is equivalent to 10 silver pieces. A silver piece is half a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. One silver piece is equivalent to 10 copper pieces, the most common coinage amongst the lowest paid working class. Then have electrum and platinum that are not unheard of, uh, but may not spend easy. Here we've got the conversion, totally fine. Electrum is one. One Electrum's worth five gold. Interesting. I, I've, I don't know if I've ever used Electrum as a piece. I mean, it does. I, I guess it's a different coinage if you're dealing in... I guess it depends on the economy. Like, if you're a silver-based economy, then having an Electrum piece makes sense just to give you, like, more space and more, like, less bulk carrying around a lot of silver pieces. If you're in a gold-based economy like most 5e games I've ever experienced or played in, splitting up your silver is less necessary. Um, let's see. Okay. Da, 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 da. I'm seeing just a lot of flavor here. Um, 
Okay, so we do have simple, martial, and rare weapons. Simple, all NPC humanoids are proficient with simple weapons. Adventurers are able to wield most of them. Okay, all that tracks. You must be proficient with martial. You must be proficient with a weapon to gain your proficiency bonus. That's true for everything. Unless noted otherwise, the weapons in this chapter are considered martial weapons. Okay, do they not talk about simple weapons at all? Or simple weapons so basic they don't really have anything to talk about besides like what how many hands it takes and the damage dice they have rare weapons unless a trait or feature grants it you can only gain proficiency with a rare weapon by training during downtime depending on the campaign setting and the narrator's discretion some rare weapons may be considered martial weapons or they may not exist at all okay interesting weapon attacks looks the same um, except unarmed strikes by default is one plus your strength modifier instead of just one damage. Okay. Melee weapons. It does look like you have, cus there's a customizing armament section later, which is cool. Melee weapons use your strength modifier for attack and damage rolls. Ranged weapons uses your dexterity modifier for the attack and damage rolls. You then have, some weapons have special properties unique to them. Okay. Here's a table, quick glance. There's these new properties, dual wielding, parry immunity, def defensive is definitely new. Um, interested to see, see how that works. But we see versatile, I mean, parrying immunity makes sense. It's like, okay, this thing can't be parried. So we'll have to kind of find out what parry is, what that intends to do. That might be in the armor section, or that I wonder if that's something a class can do. Then we have some miscellaneous a garut. Doesn't do any damage. You can make a melee weapon attack at disadvantage against a large or smaller creature that requires air to breathe on a hit. The creature's grappled and begins to suffocate. See page 420 on the suffocate condition. Okay, I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, see that. Lance, okay, net, okay, spear thrower. Oh, so it's like a thing that you stick a spear in? Wow, that's almost kind of a, like large, like war machine-esque. Not something you carry on your person, I would imagine. Um, Yeah, I'm not gonna spend any time, like all seem fine. Okay, here's some weapon properties, breaker. This weapon deals double damage to unattended objects, such as doors and walls. If this property only applies to a specific type of wood, of material such as wood, it's stated in parentheses, which we saw with like the hand axe, breaker wood. So double damage to unattended wooden items. Compounding. You can only use your strength modifier for attack and damage rolls made with this weapon. Ooh, do we see compounding? Or is that like a compounding a bow yes the composite bow has the compounding property which means that it does it's going to do more damage than the long bow but the trade-off is that it, it's or i guess maybe not maybe it doesn't but it's a strength weapon instead of a dexterity weapon so a strength built character that maybe dumps or doesn't prioritize dexterity has a ranged weapon to use but it is literally four times the cost of the longbow. I don't know why this table does, I guess it's just a properties table and not a table table, but it seems weird that it doesn't include damage on this table, right? Seems weird. Um, okay, that was compound defensive. This weapon's designed to be used with a shield of the stated degree or lighter. When you make an attack with this weapon and are using a shield designed for it, you can use a bonus action to either make an attack with your shield or increase your armor class by one until the start of your next turn. So here's here's how level up deals with shields. It's different than both how vanilla 5e does it, I think, and how like Pathfinder really abstracts and, and makes you invest in it. So in level up, you have to pair your, I think you have to pair your shield with a weapon that's designed to be used with a shield of a certain type and then if you're wielding both in in either hand, it costs you a bonus action. You then get to attack with the shield, which is cool. I, I mean, not gonna do a lot, but I wonder if some shields maybe have some extra properties that can do things like push 
or or I don't, I don't know like knock prone or something like that or you can you spend that uh bonus action to increase your armor class by one and that's how you get the use out of a shield well i guess what we'll see in a bit if if shield has things like an hp like can you damage a shield dual wielding weapons designed to be wielded in concert with another weapon when wielding another weapon in your main hand that does not have the heavy property, you can use your bonus action to make an attack with this weapon. See two weapon fighting on 446. Interesting that this is behind a weapon property, but I guess it means that anybody has access to two weapon fighting. Should we skip it? Let's just skip ahead to page 446 to look at two weapon fighting so we don't get confused. Um, action then combat shoot it was in the 240s right oh, crap melee attacks two weapon fighting here you go when you take the attack action and attack with a weapon that does not have the heavy property that you are wielding in one hand you can use your bonus action to attack with a different dual wielding melee weapon that you're holding in your offhand you do not add your ability modifier to the damage roll of the bonus attack unless that modifier is negative if a weapon has the throne property, you can make a ranged weapon attack with it instead. If you have the extra attack feature, you can use your bonus action to make two attacks with your weapon in your offhand. So if you have extra attack and you're use, utilizing two weapon fighting, you attack four times and not just three. Huh, interesting. The not adding your, your ability modifier is good since this is available to everybody. And I'm assuming specific feats or options inside a class allow you to add your ability modifier to the damage roll of that offhand attack. I believe that's how vanilla 5e handles it. Um, so yeah, that that's fine. I'm still interested in the fact that they decided to leave that in like a, as a weapon property as opposed to like other stuff, but it tracks, it's fine. So finesse, you can choose to use your dex mod. Hand mounted, this weapon's a fixed your hand. You can do simple activities such as climbing a ladder while wielding this weapon, and you have advantage on saving throws made to resist being disarmed. You cannot use a hand that is wielding a hand mounted weapon to do complex tasks like picking a lock. Okay. Or casting spells with seen components. Okay, good to know. Heavy, too small for large creatures, or too large for small creatures. I have a, they have disadvantage. Loading. This must be weapon must be loaded. You can only make one attack with a loading weapon when you use an action, or any time you attack with it, no matter what type of action, action, bonus action, or reaction to fire it, regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Uh, what action? How, what does it take to reload? Is that a bonus action to reload? Or that might I guess might be dictated by the class. Um, I don't know. Kind of interested. Uh, mounted, this weapon deals the damage listed in parentheses when you're wielding it. Mounted, okie dokie. Um, parrying, when you are wielding this weapon and you are not using a shield, once before your next turn, you can gain an expertise die to your AC against a single melee attack made against you by a, by a creature you can see. You cannot use this property while incapacitated, paralyzed, rattled, restrained, or stunned. It doesn't say that it takes a reaction, it's just you get to pick it you just say i'm um i don't really like i think this is cool i don't like huh i wonder if this has been eroded or is it expanded on later but the fact that this doesn't co cost your reaction to do so i like it, it falls outside of the action economy it's just when you're wielding the shield or when you're wielding this weapon and not using a shield just once before your next turn. So assuming this is like, it's happening on somebody else's turn, you can gain an expertise die to your AC against a single melee attack made against you by a creature. You can see it doesn't cost a reaction. I don't know. I, like I, I guess you just declare, I'm going to parry this attack. Your GM says, okay, you roll your expertise die and you see if it, hits after you add your expertise die to your ac do you get to know what the attack the result is I, I don't know like there's just man there's a lot of ambiguity there that means the gm has to make a decision which is 
like I'm sure people fall differently on the spectrum. I personally, I would rather the book tell me what it intends and then I just have to either learn more or get fast and, and have a reference sheet for things if I'm not going to memorize it rather than just not saying how this thing works exactly. So then parrying immunity are weapons. Attacks with this weapon ignore the parrying property and armor class bonuses from shields. So this is just assumed like the way this weapon works, like they're not gonna be able to parry it and they're not, like their shield isn't gonna be able to get in the way. I mean, we're definitely expanding on tactics tactical options here and level up like now all of a sudden you have this free option to parry as long as you're you're using a weapon with parrying and why wouldn't you if you're not using a shield you all of a sudden have this you know another option of choosing to add a shield for all attacks um, but the plus one to ac does kind of feel bad compared to getting an expertise die on one and would really depend on like the combat you're going into. Like sure, if I'm surrounded by 12 party level minus five goblins that are just gonna hit me for tiny amounts of damage or barely be able to hit me, maybe I'll take a plus one from my shield. But at that point, I would think I'd almost rather just be able to focus on the boss who's gonna be hitting me much harder and, and kind of tank the smaller damage i don't know but tactical options the range we have reach simple weapons thrown trip when used with a combat maneuver that trips a creature or the knockdown attack the dc is increased by one and then if you're mounted it's increased by two two weapon versatile vicious a vicious weapon scores a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20 and if you already have a feature that does this it increases the range by one where is a vicious weapon? Do we see vicious? Vicious. I don't see vicious in this table unless I'm just, I'm missing it somehow. And it's making me think that there has to be more weapons somewhere, that there has to be another table. Or it's just saying this is a property that's available and might be on magic weapons that aren't just in this basic list. I'm assuming that's what that is because I don't see vicious anywhere. Improvised weapons, fine. I don't particularly care. Okay, so we have we do have different kinds of am ammunition. Explosive um, can't benefit from expertise die. Can only hit targets within its normal range. You can't go extended at disadvantage, but on a hit, it deals extra thunder damage. Flaming same, but can does extra one d four fire damage. Then punching. On a critical hit, this ammunition decreases an armored target's armor class by one. Can't reduce it past 10, plus it's interesting. Okay. Then I have some cultural weapons. Very cool. So many weapons have equivalents in various cultures, both in real world and in fantasy campaigns. But there's a selection of weapons from different cultures that you may choose to include in your game, along with notes on how they're represented in level up. Availability of... Okay. I, I kind of see what they're going for here of like... We don't want to just assume everybody wants these, like if you're going, but if you're, you know, allowing these type of real world cultural analogs, here's a list, which is like, I respect them for the choice they made, like of how to do it. I wish it had a table instead of this list. Is there one? No, really wish they had done this as a table. I'm sure it was a layout choice, but man, what a bummer. Um, butterfly sword dueling boomerang, which is very cool. Chakram, very cool. But see, like it says, this circular bladed throwing weapon uses this, uses this to the statistics of a ring blade. So there's a ring blade here in the rare melee. Yes. Okay. So we, so we then just have these basic, these rare weapons that some of them are also analog to these cultural weapons that if you prefer to use the cultural name for it, you can. Oh, and some of these are just, okay, a claymore. It's just, it's, it just uses a statistic. It's a great sword. Wait, it's a great sword here. Costs the same. Oh, 
interesting. Okay, so some of these are literally just actually like, okay, so here's a cultural name of a thing that already exists. And then some of them like uh, Kusargama from Japan, sickle on a chain, uses the statistics of a sickle that weighs five pounds and has the dual wielding parrying immunity reach 10 foot two handed properties. I mean, very cool weapon. Again, wish this was in a table. Uh, you got like an Aztec, uh, like uh, the obsidian lined clubs, but it, they basically just, it uses a fine long sword. So how, where does fine come in? Let me see if materials fine. Uh, only uh, a fine item can be, a fine item always costs at least full price plus either 50% of the full price or 25 gold, whichever is greater. So, so it's just, it's just nice and shiny and like everybody like pays attention to it because it looks nicer than everything else okay interesting um looks like they do have firearms i think i did i see a gun over here no but there's a gun right here pistol shotgun they just have the loading ranged revolver it's got this asterisk next to loading loading a revolver which holds six bullets requires an action to load a revolver can be used to make one ranged attack per bullet loaded into it. So would it, does that mean, it, it must mean that because the revolver holds multiple bullets, it takes more than the usual loading action to load. It takes a full action to load, but you get to shoot six times with it before you have to do that. Um, I guess they didn't really go into how loading works like they didn't describe what action it takes to load the weapon um did i miss that somewhere nope ranged weapons doesn't list what it takes to reload so i i mean i'm just i i feel like i'm running into several questions that should be answered by the supporting text around the thing but they aren't um which is a bummer okay so we have shields when uh, used as an attack, like we just read, um, with the like parrying or defensive, the defensive trait. Um, it's an improvised weapon that does 1d4 weapon. Donning a shield grants no benefit to armor class if you're not proficient with shields and you are unable to take cover behind it, plant it on the ground, or sacrifice it. Um, so we have light shields, increase your armor class by one. You can throw the shield, treating it as an improvised weapon that does 1d6 bludgeoning damage. Medium. Medium shields increase your armor class by two. Oh, so shields give you an armor class bonus just by wielding it, and then you get an additional plus one if you use your bonus action while using defensive a weapon? Okay, that's still pretty good. So medium shields increase your armor class by two. Heavy shields increase you by two, and you gain an expertise die on dexterity saving throws. But when you take the dodge action while wielding it, you can instead take cover behind your shield, gaining an expertise die until the start of your turn. So basically, instead of dodging, you just get behind your shield as much as possible. But you then have disadvantage on acrobatics and stealth checks when wielding the shield. Yeah, that makes sense. You then have tower shields, which is basically a heavy shield, except they also reduce your speed by 10 feet and you can object, basically interact with it to plant it into the ground and get half cover and then put a bonus action to unplant. They are bulky and count as such even with donned. Super interesting. I mean, I, I like the added, I like the added mechanics behind it and it's relatively simple and straightforward. Um, Sacrifice shield. When you take a critical hit, you can use a reaction to block it and sacrifice your shield, turning the critical hit into a regular hit. Afterwards, your shield is broken, or if your shield is magical, it instead becomes mundane for... Okay, I don't like that. <laughs> you can't just... That breaks the fiction a little bit too much, right? Like, it's one thing to say... Like, I get it. Like, there's got to be a sacrifice. Like, there has to be a trade-off for a magical shield, but it doesn't make sense to break it. But just just say that, like, it, like it, you know, it, scrat like, it scratches the required runes or something, 
and it requires like spending time, like spending an hour or even 10 minutes with it to like polish it and realign the runes or something like that. That just feels like, or it just get hit so hard. The spell needs to go to sleep for an hour. <laughs> I don't like it. That just, it feels silly and kind of bad. Okay. Let's keep, keep going. So we have armor. We have different kinds of armor. But we also have helms. No proficiency is required to wear a helm. Um, and sometimes like, so you can wear a helm and it will give you an expertise die on saving throws, made to resist being stunned or rattled and your passive perception score is reduced by two. Okay, cool. Like a little bit of more thought and like some extra mechanics going into, into like the kind of armor you can wear. That's pretty cool. Rules around donning, doffing, sizing, and sleeping that nobody actually pays attention to. We kind of look, I, you know, of course people do. But at the same time, do they? Customizing armaments. Many weapons and pieces of armor have slight differences. If you wish to use a weapon that is functionally similar, similar to one, work with the narrator to determine how it changes visually. You can also use a combination of the weapons or armor properties and the additional properties listed here to create functionally distinct gear. As a general rule of thumb, weapons should have no more than three properties unless one of those properties is a restriction. Shields and armor should have no more than two properties. Particularly skilled craftspeople may be able to include the following properties when crafting standard gear as well. Typically, such an addition costs a minimum of 50 gold or the full cost of the base item, whichever is higher. Camouflage on armor gives you expertise die on stealth checks. So it's crafted for a terrain, and then you get expertise die based on that terrain. Interesting. Flamboyant wep for weapons. Disadvantage on saving throws made to resist being distracted by this weapon. And you have an advantage on intimidation and performance checks made to use it. That's cool. Quick draw. If you would normally only be able to draw one of these weapons on a turn, you can instead draw a number equal to the number of attacks you make get what they're going for with the math there. Like if you're, if you're a throwing daggers type guy and don't have a magic item, like a belt of returning, which, um, man, sometimes I give those out for free. If that's basically how the character wants or like what the player wants their character to do. Um, even if they don't exist, it's like the easiest magic item to homebrew. Um, rebounding thrown weapons and shields. When you make a ranged attack with this weapon or shield, you may make the attack with disadvantage. If you hit the weapon returns to your hand, piercing weapons cannot have this trait. Yep. That makes sense. So this is basically Captain America's shield at a mundane level, right? Spiked armor, stealthy storage contains a storage compartment. That's cool. Though a different materials for stuff. So we got like silvered and mithril and adamantine bone. Pretty cool. Then you can customize shields to be hands-free mirrored or with spikes. Um, mundane weapons and armor wear out over time. Keeping them in good working order requires maintenance and repair. Regular day-to-day -day maintenance is assumed. However, adventurers frequently encounter unusual events that are exceptionally hard on gear. In that case, the narrator could call for a DC 10 maintenance check or DC 15 if the stress was particularly severe. That's a big jump. Uh, so getting back used to reading 5e math, you know what I mean? Um, if you're proficient with the tools required to repair your gear as listed in the table materials, add your proficiency bonus to the check. On a failure or until the roll is made successfully, gear is damaged. Damaged, an action is required to draw a damaged weapon or prepare a damaged spell casting focus travel paces halved for a travel vehicle for a damaged vehicle. Okay. So a broken item is also damaged. So wait, if when you fail a maintenance check and your gear is already damaged, it becomes broken and it cannot be used with full effectiveness until ref this feels pretty like, well, what I'll say is I would not use this system if I ran the game, unless it really felt, felt really, really bad. Um, I would, you know what? I might use this as like a fumble 
consequence for a out of combat natural one for instance like you're trying to climb a cliff you know you rolled a natural one the dc was a 10 you know i don't want to keep you from being able to do anything but at the same time it'd be funny if you fell and broke something small like maybe you broke broke your thieves tools you fell weird and it like landed on the pocket that holds that or you know more like you broke a dagger that kind of thing like i could see getting getting some use out of that um we give out some more material properties which is fun but feels self-explanatory medicinals not everyone has access to magical healing spells the following herbal remedies and potions can be commonly available from apothecaries and herbalists at the narrator's discretion drinking or administering a potion or remedy takes an action expertise dice granted by the use of medicine can only be gained from that type of medicine once per long rest so you got some stuff that can do some stuff so you can get a bandage to end ongoing piercing or slashing damage. Let's see, we do have healing potions here that start at 50 gold and start doing, at basic, it's a 2d4 plus two hit points. Cool. Then I have spellcasting foci, which is very cool. You have some common poisons, some survival gear. Um, rations, uh, the level up definitely feels like the kind of system for GMs that like to keep track of the rations that someone bought in the city and is using like, yeah, that kind of like, it's not mean, right? It just feels, it feels true to me. It feels very, very true. And okay, here, here's where I have a bone pick who what GM out there is making their party buy mosquito netting to the point where it needs to be listed out in the adventuring equipment list? It provides no mechanical benefit. It's not like there's a hazard of, you know, contracting malaria from mosquitoes in the jungle and mosquito netting makes you immune from that. It's it just uh, no it provides protection from small insects like i guess you can infer that but it's not explicitly listed like it, it just says yeah mosquito netting exists it's like yeah like i guess of course like i i don't i get sometimes you have to kind of fill this was like a minimum word from a contractor type thing <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on it. I'm sure mosquito netting exists in lots of other game systems, like explicitly spelled out, but with no mechanical benefit like this. But as a casual GM who enjoys what he does and tries to not nickel and dime or create a ton of bookkeep, unnecessary, unnecessary in my eyes, bookkeeping, uh, unstat blocked mosquito netting feels like unnecessary bookkeeping by a lot by a lot a lot okay we then just have like okay we've got stuff i'm not, I'm not about to like jump into that we've got packs it was like pre pre-arranged packs with stuff that you know easy to sell off um your normal stuff we got some gambling outcomes mounts feeding your mounts again type of unnecessary stuff I wouldn't want to do. Oh, random table of mount traits. I kind of love that. That's funny. Every mount's different. So for like, if you just hired a horse or a donkey to take you somewhere, getting some of these, oh man. Okay. Now this is the, this isn't bookkeeping. This is a GM resource to make your world more believable i love this mount traits table so cool love that land vehicles water vehicles air vehicles i'm glad those are statted we've got some siege weaponry that's statted some mount functions for the vehicles some special features um 
uh, basically a paragraph telling you that you can make your own. Thank you. Okay, we got lifestyle expenses. Do we though? No. Yes. Poor, poor, uh, da -da 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 -da. a poor lifestyle inflicts a minus one prestige penalty to a min to a minimum of zero. Haven't seen prestige yet. Moderate doesn't affect your prestige and then rich okay but it doesn't tell you how it, that's not what i was expecting when i saw lifestyle expenses <laughs> right uh i was expecting to see like a life spending gold magic some basic magic items for sale see i want to i like if i'm a sorcerer i want to spend my hundred gold extra from that starting gold to go and buy like maybe a basic healing potion and a couple of spell scroll cantrips or maybe a first level spell scroll I am glad that all this is tabled out. This is the kind of stuff that isn't in the D and D five E rule book. As far as I know, maybe it's buried somewhere in the DMG that nobody reads, but, uh, wow. Donations. Wow. Crazy. And then we got starting wealth, uh, based on level. Jesus. It's a lot of money. Some uncommon pets and some rare pets. Ooh, blink dog, my favorite. Um, and then what are these? starting gear past first level that's nice how to build a stronghold amazing i'm not going to dig into the stronghold rules but i will tell you that the strongholds exist in level up if you don't want to use the stronghold and followers rules from um from mcmdm the matt colville's development company then there is uh strongholds here in level up um I'm not going to do it because that's the kind of rule set that someone like, I don't want to create, like create free access to content that other people spend a lot of time and money creating. Um, it's one thing to look at like the basics of how the system works. It's another thing of to have this whole subsystem that I'm sure level up spend a lot of time creating and statting out and play testing. Um, that is a completely optional system. It is here. Uh, I, if you like the idea of having strongholds for your players and still want to continue playing 5e and for some reason don't want to use the stronghold rules from MC, MCDM, maybe you don't like them. Maybe they're too much for you. Level up does have a like eight to 10 page section on strongholds here in chapter four equipment. And that's where we're going to stop for the day. 45 minutes seems like a good enough time was the equipment i'm i'm getting a, a better sense of the game weapon and armor properties are cool without going um uh, without going all the way into like pathfinder territory um where you know there's a lot of things that aren't self-explanatory in a weapon trait that you got to kind of remember and keep an eye on this seems really really cool um it's more than vanilla 5e without being hideously over uh over work booked creating more work for the players outside of some silly things that are i think are silly in multiple systems like the mosquito net that's not a level up only funny thing um i've seen that in other places too so if you like this video is about level up or if you've played level up and i have some stories to tell or something you want to call out as something i got wrong or something you're really looking forward to let me know in the comments. I'm going to keep making these. I just recently put out a video about Star Trek Adventures, the 2D20 system from Modifius. I'm a big Trekkie. I've never been able to play Star Trek Adventures, though one of my favorite actual plays was a Star Trek Adventures uh, actual play. So if you're at all interested in playing a tabletop role-playing game in the Star Trek universe, go check out that video on my channel. Um, and I'll continue doing more videos kind of like as they pop up um it doesn't seem like a ton of people are interested in monster of the week stuff uh i just don't think the people interested in my channel or subscribe to my channel are necessarily looking for that level of um rule mechanics light games or there i'm sure there's other youtubers who are much better at it and a better uh, faster, more edited version. So I might come back to monster of the week, but it doesn't seem like the audience is clamoring for it. So we'll keep doing level up. Um, we'll keep doing pathfinder 2 E stuff as stuff comes out and I get interested. Um, and, 
Uh, maybe more Star Trek Adventure stuff too, because I think we'll, we'll get into character creation next. So if you like all of that and are interested, subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to come up with videos at least once or twice a week. Um, and, and let me know what you'd be interested in seeing more of in the comments. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon. Peace.